Hello, and welcome to What is Innovation? The podcast that explores the reality of a word that is in danger of losing its meaning altogether. This podcast is produced by Outlast Consulting, LLC, a boutique consultancy that helps companies use innovation principles to solve their toughest business problems. I'm your host, Jared Simmons, and I'm so excited to have Nadia Labs. Nadia has increased efficiency, sustainability, and business growth of mission-driven organizations through the On Purpose program through the Impact Collective, which she helped set up, and as a co-founder at SafetyNet Technologies. Previously, she worked in consumer research and product development at P&G, started her own business, and picked up business knowledge from NCAD. Using human-centered design approach, she loves to help organizations become sustainably and socially successful by developing and implementing business plans that work and finding innovative alternatives with actionable solutions to the challenges they are trying to tackle. She has a Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Texas, an MBA from NCAD, and a Certificate in Social Sector Leadership from the University of California, Berkeley High School of Business. Nadia, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Jared. Nice intro. <laughs> you, nice career. <laughs> it's, hey. uh, it's amazing, amazing stuff you've been up to uh, since last we spoke. Years I know. and years. It's been a while. It has been. It's been too long. Looking at your bio, it was back in the consumer research and product development at PNG days. So, uh, yeah, I think I left in 2013. So it yeah. has been a while. It's good to yeah. see you again. Yeah, yeah, likewise, likewise. So uh, I can't wait to, to hear about all the new stuff you've been up to and, and things like that. So why don't we dive right in? Sure. Sounds good. All right. So tell me, what is innovation? The leading question. Yeah. So much pressure. <laughs> so in terms of what I was thinking of my response for this question is that it actually stems from our days at PNG. Mm. Mm-hmm. A lot of it being on like the way that PNG does their products research and being very human centric and user focused. Yes. So I think the innovation for me, at least, mm-hmm. that I think is sustainable in the long run relies on having that human centered approach to things mm. and really tackling kind of like the root of the problems that the person that you're solving for is 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 experiencing Mm. so innovation for me i think is having a good understanding of what that is and knowing the basis of the the problem for the for the person how to solve that challenge for them Mm. but then finding like sustainable ways to bring that forward and implement that solution yeah well that's great that does have a lot of foundation in you know, the way we were raised in the PNG days in terms of how to think about that. But it also has elements of parts of your value system in it, in terms of doing that in a way that's sustainable and helping people. We talked about solving problems for people, but the word help in the context that you used, it doesn't really apply to kind of what we were trained to do. You know what I mean? You could use what we were trained to do to help, but that wasn't at the root of it. But I hear it at the root of your definition of innovation. Right. Yeah. And I think, I mean, um, I guess fairness to PNG, they actually planted that seed in me, right? Even in terms of the health aspect. So yeah. maybe not solely. Like, I think also we did a lot of volunteer work together back in Cincinnati. Yeah, um, and so I think part of it was rooted on, on wanting to help in that way. Yeah. But it was also through uh, some of the projects that I got to work on at PNG was to help like the bottom of the pyramid and figuring mm-hmm. out products and services that could help those in developing countries and how, how to kind of yeah. help them out of the poverty line. So there was elements of that that were seeded from that. But I think, yeah, it was kind of that construct of support from PNG, the voluntary stuff that we were also doing and just having, I guess, experienced a bit of the world where I saw inequality and injustice mm-hmm. and, and wanting to see how I could make my mark to, to help improve that if I could. Right, right. So tell me about, you know, you mentioned inequality and injustice. And I know personally that you're a bit of a traveler, which is a funny understatement <laughs> for those who know you. Tell me about what you've seen in different places and, and in different cultures and environments and how that has shaped your view of what innovation is and how it can be useful. Yeah, I mean. I think having had the luxury really of being able to experience a lot of the world 
has been enlightening in so many ways yeah. because it's, it's, you know, experiencing great cultures and people and attitudes and, and innovations in, in, in every realm as well. Yeah. But also seeing kind of the inequality of like the haves and the have nots mm-hmm. and seeing that as a really big divide. And part of that being innovation that might not be created or developed for the the have nots and maybe just focus more on the haves Mm -hmm. or also whether it's developing innovations for the have nots that as I mentioned sustainable in the long term so right it's it's a bit of like that white savior complex sometimes coming in it's like oh yes I want to help the have nots but really have no idea on finding a way to create a solution that can actually live in that in that realm and survive in a long-term way or be adopted yeah Right, right. And I love the fact that you use the term sustainable in its full sense. Nowadays, when you hear the word sustainable in a business context, it is almost always attached to environmental impact, right? So if you're talking about a sustainable solution, people think, oh, it's green. Right. But when you say sustainable, you mean the humanistic, enduring impact version of sustainable, which is my favorite use of the word. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's, I think that's probably, I mean, obviously that's the, where it originated from and, right. um, but the intent of it being that long lasting thing, but yeah, now more labeled with a, a bit of a greenwash to it, I guess. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Which, which makes it sometimes difficult to talk about the broader definition of sustainability and things being sustainable. I think it has made it more difficult to, to have that conversation because the language is because it Rooted kind of that. yeah, I kind of lost the language around it a bit. So it's good to hear good to hear you um, keeping the, that definition alive. That's awesome. So as you move through these different cultures and see different things and have different experiences, I would imagine that you know what is new in one culture might not be new in another. You know, and when we talk about innovation, a lot of times people kind of conflate it with newness. Yeah. How is your view shaped around kind of seeing those different, those different sort of stages in different places? Oh man, I, I mean, this podcast lasts like five hours if I <laughs> went off on a tirade on this, but basically I'm a, I'm a big advocate, I guess you could say towards the idea that innovation doesn't have to be like the new and sexy mm-hmm. and it doesn't have to be your own startup and things like that. Right. Because I think there's such like a stigma to like innovation, new exciting yep it hopefully is always exciting but it does definitely does not have to be new so even taking things where it it might be an old way of doing it but in a new way Mm -hmm. or just as you said like reapplying in a different market where that it hasn't been seen yet even for example i I was mentioning like there is innovation within the have-nots communities right so Mm -hmm. seeing innovation there where for example even uh, one example is like mpesa in in kenya Mm. and that being like such a leapfrog for for kenya and Mm -hmm. and being able to access finance but that something like that on that technological advance not yet being available in western countries yet so really being able to learn from from the from all those types of different innovations and reapply it to different opportunities and markets so yeah, it's definitely not always the the new and sexy of, of like the Western world, as I think innovation sometimes gets put into that bucket. Mm, well said, well said. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I also like that you highlighted when you say people have this kind of new and different equals innovation kind of thing in their heads, but it's also that things flow from haves to have nots. That's the way innovation, that's the way, you know, new ideas, good ideas, good things flow from haves to have nots. And that's this sort of implicit bias in the world, both economically and racially and, you know, in class systems in different communities. Yeah. And what I've found, you know, I grew up in rural Southeast Alabama and my grandmother, she didn't have a high school education, but she was, you know, brilliant in how she solved problems and approached things and structured things. And, you know, she would tell my mom, stand, you know, with your feet closer together in the kitchen, you take up less space, you know, I'm like, oh, who would think of that? Yeah. You know, so ways of thinking and conceptual ideas that lead to new and different things can come from, you know, it's a continuum. It's not necessarily a flow in one direction. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's a lot of that, like that street smartness too, that brings about a lot of innovation. I mean, same with my mom, like 
she didn't go to college, but she is street smart as hell. Yeah. And um, a lot of the ideas that, that come from her are, are things that can really be applied to kind of the broader markets and mainstream, right? So Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, and it's funny when someone, and even more with you, if someone looks at your background, you know, PNG, you're an engineer, you know, Cal Berkeley, all those things, you know, they would assume, oh, well, yeah, she's very smart and she's learned a lot from those places. But what I've found, again, not with the same kind of, background that you have but what I found is that a lot of what I learned and apply every day in dealing with people and solving problems I got you know in rural Alabama in my grandmother's kitchen yeah without discrediting those uh, <laughs> institutions and how much money I've spent on them. <laughs> but like I think one of the major benefits of going there is that is exactly like having the background knowledge already but it was more about the confidence on then being able yes. to apply that right Exactly, exactly. The confidence, the structure, the community, the people you, you know, you're around and I, new ideas you're exposed to, there's definitely value in it. And I think it can sometimes obscure the fact that we learn from a lot of different things and experiences and places, you know, you've been yeah. a lot of places and seen a lot of things. I'm sure you learned a lot from those environments as well. Well, and, and that's the thing. It doesn't take, you know, world travel to do that. It's just having that open-mindedness to be open to, to being influenced and kind of seeing different experiences as well. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, uh, that's for sure. That is for sure. So uh, tell me a bit about Safety Net. I'd love to hear a little bit about Safety Net Technologies. Sure. Yeah, so Safety Net Technologies is a, a startup that I got involved in about five years ago. Um, so at that point, I was working as a consultant, helping different organizations with their social or environmental impact. Mm -hmm. And I met Dan, so my co-founder and CEO, uh, through a common friend. And he told me about the technology he was building, where it was helping attract the right fish, but repelling the wrong fish within the fishing industry. Brilliant. And I was like, this is very weird. And also because I have no knowledge about the fishing industry at all. But I was like, that sounds really cool because, you know, there's a lot of waste that happens in the fishing industry. Mm -hmm. And I never really thought about, you know, more effective catch. Yeah. And so the fact that he was working on this technology, he'd been working on it, I think at that point for five, six years or so. And I was like, you've gotten some really great results of being able to reduce bycatch. So the unwanted capture of fish hmm. by up to 90% in, in some of these scientific case studies. So wow. why haven't you taken this to market where you can really make that impact at scale, right? Within the large commercial fishing industries. Yeah. Um, he was like, well, you know, um, I'm busy working on the technology I'm an yeah, engineer exactly <laughs> so, sorry it's only 24 hours in the right in the and at that day, point yeah. it was him and also other co-founder Aaron who was you know working also as a part-time basis and building mm -hmm. some of these early prototypes and so I had just done my MBA uh, and I was like right let me help you get this to market I will write you a business plan and I'll get us there within six months you know because yeah. I was like you've got the technology you've got that proven it's built in a way with a very human-centric design so we work with fishers to build the technology to understand what their needs are hmm. and how it fits into their existing operations ah, okay and so that for me was was kind of the nugget because I was like right this is something I can get really passionate about because I know they're solving for a root problem. I can see a sustainable business model out of this because, you know, there should be demand. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I wrote a, the, the initial business plan. Ooh. It, it wasn't so much six months, four years later. Yeah. You know, give or we take. We're now getting to market. <laughs> or five, maybe even. But yeah, given COVID. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so it all took a little bit longer, but it was a really exciting technology and, and concept that I really got behind because of that again, user-centric aspect, but also the potential to see how it could scale yeah. within the fishing industry globally. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's amazing. And the basic premise of the technology is in the fishing industry, you try to catch certain fish and not catch other fish. <laughs> and one of the big problems is that you haul in your nets and if they're full of the wrong fish, it creates yield issues. What do you do with the wrong, the, you know, all those other things. And so safety net technologies allows fishers to catch the right fish and only the right fish. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. Thanks okay. for doing the pitch. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just trying to make sure I understand it. It's a brilliant, simple, elegant is the word I'm looking for. It's a very elegant yeah. solution to a real a problem that has ramifications well beyond what, what I think the average person would really understand and internalize. 
And it's exactly that. I think it's it's the simplicity of it, right? So mm-hmm. it's not a new, sexy, overly complicated technological product uh, that needs to be introduced into the industry. We use light as the attraction and repulsion mechanism mm-hmm. of, of these devices. And so light has actually been around for centuries yeah. in terms of the fishing industry. Yeah. It just hasn't scaled the way that it, it needs to with the industry because a lot of that research is done in labs and in scientific reports. And so how do you then translate that to industry to make it something that's a product that they want to use? Right, right. And it, yeah, and that's that whole continuum where, you know, on the bench top, proof of concept is that innovation. There's a whole argument and discussion around that. And, you know, okay, taking something that was already proven or already known and putting it into the market, it doesn't matter. It's solving a business problem, solving not only a business problem, but a, a life problem, a human-centered problem. I mean, mm-hmm. that's not an easy industry. No. It's not a physically easy industry, and it doesn't have um, a world of transferable skills. Right, exactly. If you've been fishing for 20 years, that's where your skill set is. So being able to, to help folks like that take their mastery and get more out of it, people in, in that industry are, are brilliant. And the, the things they're able to do and the skills they bring to the table right. um, are valuable. And, and so to be able to help them capture more fish, you know, <laughs> right yeah. fish, wrong fish, whatever, you're helping them get more out of the skills and the expertise that they've honed over the years. Yeah. And actually, that's a, another good point. The fact that there are these brilliant, you know, fishers out there and the, the knowledge that they have and that they sit on. And maybe that's another part of the answer of what is innovation. Innovation is not doing it alone, right? So mm-hmm. sure, we, we've got our engineers and our business modelers and, you know, thinking about it from one aspect. But at the end of the day, it requires their input to make sure that this is something that works for them. Mm-hmm. It also requires the input of like regulators of mm-hmm. making sure that our technology fits in line with that. Right. It needs to fit in with all the different stakeholders and work together in order to make it an innovation that lasts and can be adopted. Right. And it can't just be done by one. Oh, so true. So true. And, and putting the right human at the center is the key to all of that. So I think the fact that you all keep the right humans at the center of this human-centered approach is also key. And, and I, I really um, admire you all for that. That's a wonderful technology with so many great benefits. And, and the human centered p- portion of it is only, is just, uh, is just, you know, icing on an amazing cake. Thank you. Yeah, of course. The other thing I wanted to ask about safety net is hearing you talk about it. You know, I can see you, I've seen your face light up as you talk about it. I don't remember you talking about fish before, <laughs> you know, back when I knew you in Cincinnati. So yeah, I think, I think another aspect of innovation, tell me if I'm wrong here, but is it, it doesn't have to be domain specific. Like you can fall in love with the, with the impact exactly. when something is innovative and it's not necessarily about, oh, do I love fish? Do I hate fish? What do I know about fish? I still don't know enough about fish. <laughs> like, <laughs> people often ask me, they're like, what fish should I be eating? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> um, no. And, and the, but yeah, exactly that. It's the impact. So, I mean, I rely on like our marine biologists within mm-hmm. the team and our scientists network and the, like the fishing industry to, to really know those, those areas. Cause I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm even after five, six years, I still don't know anything compared to them. Right. Right. But for me, what, what the driver is, is that impact. So I'm a bit of an impact junkie in that sense. Yeah. And that's why I got, I got involved, right? Because I was like, I have no idea about the fishing industry, <laughs> right. but I can see with kind of doing a little bit of market research that there is a really big opportunity here to, to make that impact happen at scale. Mm-hmm. And that's what's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, all the best to you all. It's a, a worthwhile venture in so many different areas and I'm excited and uh, I hope you have uh, lots of continued growth and success. Thanks. Shifting gears a bit, I want to ask you about, and I've mentioned it a few times, but travel. Is that, would you consider that a hobby of yours? It's more of an addiction. An uh, addiction. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'd like to, I'd like to talk to people about hobbies on this show, because there's a lot, I think, in the way you view innovation come, that comes through in sort of what you do in your spare time. Mm. And uh, so tell me about travel. Oh, wow. I call it an addiction, but I think it's also something that has always been a constant in my life. So yeah. um, again, I had the opportunity of, of traveling and, and moving a lot as, as a kid because um, mm-hmm. of my dad's jobs. 
and because of that, getting to see the world. And so for, for me, a constant was that about on average, every two years or so, we would pack up and move to another country. Wow. And I just kind of thought that was the norm. <laughs> to another country, not, right. not like to Nebraska. From, <laughs> no, no, no. Or whatever. Yeah, and, like, and so I, I moved to the US when I was 13, 14 years old. And it was wow. the first time that I was like in a public school with kids who you know lived there their whole life. And I was like, oh, so this is what normal is, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think because... I had, and I, I guess that's like the rooted thing in me where I, I just, I need that change. I, I'm an impact junkie and a change junkie, basically. Yeah, yeah. Where every few years I get, you know, cold feet and my, I need to go somewhere <laughs> and find the next big thing that I can help with. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that change, like you said, it doesn't always have to be physical, you know, can be made through travel. But I think you mentioned earlier that that change can also be, you know, you can you can find ways to change your outlook, change your perspective, change your point of view, change the people you're surrounding yourself with yeah. and progressive change. Exactly. I can definitely relate to that. Yeah. And I think change can be really healthy. Mm-hmm. Keeps you on your toes. You know, you, you learn new skills, you adapt. And therefore, I think it makes you a bit yeah, op- open to, to others and understanding what what kind of challenges are there that are maybe outside of your own realm. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And it, it's it's that kind of attitude toward change, I think, that really determines how people react because we don't choose change, right? Sometimes we do, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you're a change junkie, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Some of us choose change. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But, you know, change comes to all of us, mm-hmm. whether we choose it or not. And uh, I think just having that positive and proactive attitude toward change is important in life, but also in, in business as you're going through your career, because you can't avoid change. There's going to be reorganizations. Companies are going to, yeah. you know, be formed. They're going to fail. They're going to, you know, you're going to join startups. They're not going to work out. It's just all sorts of different versions of change. I mean, and and again, I feel like this is probably going off into a tangent, but even the things like, for example, mental health being so important, right? Where oh, man. if change, you can either be rigid to change and that can really, really impact you badly. And, mm-hmm. and you don't kind of like bounce back from that versus being open to it, whether it's good or bad initially, you can just kind of form with it and then learn how to react healthily to that so that you can adjust and adapt. Um, That can be helpful to to yourself as well then. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mental health is never a tangent Mm -hmm. (laughs) when you're talking about uh, anything involving people. You're you're exactly right. Preserving and protecting your mental health in in any way you can is going to make you more resilient to change. It's going to allow you to approach change with different with a different um, point of view and an understanding that not everybody's in the same place from a mental health standpoint. Yeah. And as you're changing things, understanding what that might feel like to different different people that are in different places uh, as it relates to mental health. Yeah, exactly. It's the crux of everything we do. And uh, so I'm glad you brought that up. That's a great point. So one more question. <laughs> it's been a great conversation. I, I, I have a dozen questions pinging around in my head, but I'll ask this question. Do you have any advice for innovators out there, people who, you know, hear your background and think, oh, yeah, that's that's a great, you know, I'd, I'd love to have a career like that. I'd love to have experiences like that. You know, any advice? Yeah, uh- Take it with a grain of salt. It might not be for everyone, but I think (laughs) to wrap all that stuff up is it's understanding, like really understanding the root of the problem. And and that requires empathy, right? So the human centric aspect of it, but really putting yourself in someone else's shoes and not just their shoes, they're just their lives and seeing what it's like to, to experience life from their world and what kind of issues they face is, I think the the seed of what then innovation can be born from because you as an individual can come in with all these extra or additional or different types of experiences and and backgrounds and and advantages that you can then be like oh actually you know this is this what i've seen in my life that could be applied to this problem here mm-hmm. but you won't know that know that until you're in that person's situation right so one is get to know the, the the customers the people the beneficiaries that you're trying to serve and really getting into their lives and understanding how they operate and what their needs are mm-hmm. and then yeah I, I think not necessarily needing something new and sexy like I think that a lot of the innovation can be brought from 
your own skills being applied in different methods. So it doesn't have to be your own startup, like find things that you're passionate about and see where the missing gaps are, where you can help fill um, versus having to create something brand new and from start and by yourself, I think would be a, a good, good start. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing advice. That is a, uh, I, I love that. And uh, thank you for sharing it with me and with the, the with our listeners. And I appreciate your time, uh, Nadia. And uh, I know you're busy and you're in a way different time zone. And so I appreciate you making time to, to chat with me and, and with everyone. And, uh, and uh, thank you. No worries. Thank you. And yeah, I've, always make time for you this is busy is such a buzzword but I think everyone's busy these days so it's, it's not an excuse <laughs> oh I'm I'm with you on that it's uh yeah I, I, I can't think if it's Emerson or Thoreau one of them said it's not that we're busy it's what are we busy about right that's what I try to focus on as well so thank you for a wonderful conversation and I'm just excited to see where where safety net technologies goes from here thank you Jared cheers all right take care We'd love to hear your thoughts about this week's show. You can drop us a line on Twitter at Outlast LLC, O-U-T-L-A-S-T-L-L-C, or follow us on LinkedIn where we're Outlast Consulting. Until next time, keep innovating, whatever that means.